Welcome to today's Skeleton Key Study Group Webinar. I'm so happy that you've joined us today for this conversation about Joseph Campbell's book, The Flight of the Wild Gander. In the new study guide that the Campbell Foundation has just published to accompany this book is out now, and we're so delighted to have made it available. The Joseph Campbell Foundation invites you to experience the power of myth. So if you hear that call to adventure, you are in the right place. The name of this particular webinar comes from one of Joseph Campbell's early books, which was called A Skeleton Key to Finnegan's Wake. The book was a guide to reading James Joyce's novel, Finnegan's Wake, as the title probably suggests, and we are using that reference to Skeleton Keys as the name of our new series of study guides for books about Joseph Campbell to honor that thinking that he was engaged in back so many years ago. These study guides are intended to companion you as you read Campbell's work, perhaps find yourself inspired by his ideas, and maybe, just maybe, carry them forward into your own work. My name is John Booker, and I am delighted to be the executive director of the Joseph Campbell Foundation. I feel so fortunate to have the author of The Flight of the Wild Gander Study Guide with us today, Dr. Evans Lansing Smith. And the two of us will have a conversation, then we'll have time for Q&A. So feel free to send us your questions via that Q&A button anytime at all during the session. And we do have another promo code to share with you. So try, if you can, to resist the temptation to do any book shopping until the end of the webinar. It will be worth your wait. So before we go on, I'd like to introduce some of the JCF team who are here with us today making this webinar possible. And let me give you a uh, brief uh, introduction of who they are, and then we'll hear just a word from each of them so you can see their faces and um, get, get a sense of uh, uh, who they are. So the uh, first JCF staff member we have with us today is Tori Yates Orr. She serves as our content creator, and she is brilliant on so many levels. We're so happy to have her with us today. We've also got the amazing Tyler Lapkin, who serves as our podcast producer and our social media coordinator. Tyler is awesome. I am so glad he can be with us today. We have the one and only, the legendary, Stephen Geringer, our community coordinator and the author of the book Myth and Modern Living, as well as a new title coming soon from the Joseph Campbell Foundation that will be part of Campbell's Collected Works, and we'll be announcing that soon. Uh, and myself, uh, John Booker, the Foundation's Executive Director, I'm so glad to be with all of you today. So with that, I'll invite the team to say hello and introduce themselves. So Tori, would you like to lead us off? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just so happy to be here. Um, I love meeting all of my people in myth. So I'm happy to be here and I'm excited to be in the chat. Um, I'll be in the chat. But again, if you have any questions, you can put them in that Q&A um, at the bottom. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Tyler, could you uh, say a few words of greeting for us? I just want to say hello to everybody. Like John said, I'm the podcast producer. I help coordinate our social media. I'm just excited that all of you are here today and are excited about myth and uh, looking forward to a, a great conversation. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, Stephen, please jump in here and say hello. Well, hello, everybody. I have been involved with the Joseph Campbell Foundation now for a couple of decades, and then some most of my responsibilities revolve around community, which today's event definitely is great to be with members of my tribe. 
Mm. Thank you so much, team, for those intros. We'll be getting to our special guest, uh, Lance, here in just one moment. Um, but I, I so appreciate this JCF team for helping make today's uh, webinar possible. This, by the way, is a great time to open up the chat, everyone, and let's hear a round of virtual applause for the team, for Tori and Tyler and Steven and everything they work on uh, to, to help us all experience the power of myth. And while you have the chat open, let us know where you're zooming in from. Um, I'm joining in today, <coughs> excuse me, from the Los Angeles area, and I'm so excited to introduce Lance and his study guide to us uh, today. Um, Tori, what's going on in the chat? Where are people uh, coming in from today? We have a very wide range. We've got Brazil, Hong Kong, Mexico, Ireland, Nigeria, um, Brooklyn. I hope you're doing well with all the, the rain in Brooklyn. Um, New Mexico. Um, South Africa, West Palm Beach, North Cali, LA, like you are, Germany, Kansas City, San Diego, Calgary, Westchester, all over. Wow, wow, what a what a great uh, group, what a great collective of of the myth curious and those who uh, uh, have chosen to be with us today. We're so glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. We welcome everyone from every mythic tradition in every uh, every corner of the earth. So we uh, are going to go ahead and move forward and talk just a bit about what a skeleton key study guide is so that you've got a sense of that in case you would be interested in um, uh, purchasing one of these because they're they're well worth your um, uh, your, your, your dollars, I can promise you. But let us, let us tell you a bit more about what one of these guides uh, are. Skeleton key study guides uh, are, are not just um, something that uh, are, are meant for academics, but um, they, they can unlock many doors for anyone because they've been filed down to the essentials. They've been meant to take Joseph Campbell's work and present it in a way that someone who may not be familiar with it can come into that material with a, a, a more clear sense of what it's about. We designed these books to help teachers, students, creatives, book clubs, all myth-minded readers discover Campbell's insights and experience the power of myth, and that includes you. You'll find concise chapter summaries of Campbell's chapters, plus reading lists and prompts for discussions, essay topics, creative projects. Um, the, the, these things are just packed full of, of great um, information and, uh, and helpful resources. This is what the cover of the Flight of the Wild, Wild Gander Study Guide looks like. And this is um, one of those insights from Campbell that's in the study guide uh, that we, we have on screen for you there. Um, sometimes it's helpful to have someone pull out these nuggets, these quotes that uh, are, are, um, are, are buried within the text. And that's one of the, the many things that this study guide uh, does. Here is what uh, some of the pages look like. Uh, as you can see, there, there's beautiful imagery, but there's also really wonderful insights uh, that Lance has provided for us and um, it really helps us understand uh, the big ideas that Campbell was presenting uh, through this book, as well as insights that Lance brings uh, as a mythologist to um, you know, has spent so much of his life working with Campbell's ideas and with this material. Here's another one of my particular favorite um, pages in uh, the, the book uh, around the Brothers Grimm and the fairy tale. Uh, we have another wonderful quote here as we just look through some of these pages and just seeing what is in the book. You'll get a sense as we uh, click through here. Um, again, it, it's really worth um, the, the, the few dollars that we ask for it, that those dollars uh, are a gift to the foundation that helps support us in our work, and we appreciate every gift uh, that is brought to us. 
Well, uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our, our guest for today. And uh, this is a real treat for me uh, because I, I've known Lance for a number of years and um, he is, he is uh, uh, just one of the special people in my life. Um, but Evans Lansing Smith PhD is core faculty in the Mythological Studies program at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, California. He's taught at colleges in Switzerland, Maryland, Texas, California. He's the recipient of awards for distinguished teaching and publication from Midwestern State University in Texas and Pacifica Graduate Institute in California. In the 1970s, Dr. Smith traveled with Joseph Campbell on mythological study tours of Northern France, of Egypt, and of Kenya. His edited volume of Joseph Campbell's writings and lectures on the Grail Romances was published in 2015, and his edition of the Selected Correspondences of Joseph Campbell was published in 2019. He also has led mythological study tours focusing on the Grail Romances in England and France, and is the author of a novel and two books of poetry, plus 11 books and numerous articles on comparative literature and mythology. Let's hear some virtual applause for Lance in the chat. Lance, welcome. It is such a pleasure to have you uh, with us today in this webinar. Well, it's my pleasure, John. Well, Lance, I want to jump right in, uh, and we we can jump into conversation uh, about so many topics. But um, I, I would love to to start today by asking you what drew you initially to myth. You've spent so much of your life around myth, and what was it that brought you to myth? Well, I, it's a it's a long and winding road, as they say. But a lot of my um, education up before I met Joseph Campbell uh, at, uh, at Williams College and uh, afterwards was devoted to reading uh, the great modernist literature, uh, Proust and D.H. Lawrence, Thomas Mann and James Joyce. And uh, in the arts, of course, uh, Picasso and Kandinsky and Clay, and in music, uh, Stravinsky and the Rites of Spring. And uh, Martha Martha Graham's company with the mythically inspired dances, so I was kind of immersed in that world of uh, comparative literature, uh, comparative mythology, without even knowing what mythology was, uh, which laid the foundation for my engagement with myth. But I have to say, really, it it, it came out uh, uh, spontaneously in the form of a very powerful dream. Uh, I had when I was 26, and I was heading off to Dublin for two summers of writing uh, poetry and a novel. And really, it was that particular dream that I shared with one of my companions in the writing uh, workshops uh, in Dublin, who uh, came down the hall to me after I wrote a poem based on the dream and said I should read two books. And one was The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And the other was the uh, portable Jung that uh, Joseph Campbell had put together. And essentially, uh, that was my uh, introduction to myth as its own separate kind of discipline. And it greatly expanded uh, my, my uh, understanding of, of myth and, and deaf psychology and reinforced my passionate commitment to exploring those works of modernist culture that uh, engaged myth in very profound ways. And uh, this, of course, is also a very personal kind of development when, when things emerge in a dream, it has an unexpected impact on the trajectory of one's life. And I was already kind of on a journey that was taking me away uh, from all the standard roles of the collective, having grown up in Baltimore and expected to be a lawyer, insurance, or mortgage banking, or something like that. Uh, I had no interest whatsoever in those things, but I had a deeply rooted interest in the arts and literature. And I uh, thank God for somebody like Joseph Campbell to show up in my life at that time, whose interests were very close to mine, 
and embraced all of the major disciplines of the humanities that I was interested in, but then, you know, took it to a much higher level given the broad range of his scholarship and his engagement with the mythologies of the world. So it really uh, came out of a dream that uh, led to my readings in, in Campbell's work. And then uh, immediately related to that, these marvelous trips, the first one to France, uh, focusing on the grail romances, and then shortly thereafter to, uh, to Egypt and Africa. So it, uh, it really myth opened up a whole, a whole new world of powerful symbolic stories and images. Um, so I would say, in a nutshell, John, my engagement came out of dream. Mm. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah. yeah. Lance, you, you've you spent so much of your life, you know, swimming in these waters of, of myth and um, uh, of taking on these uh, ideas that Joseph Campbell presented. Um, you know, in, in your opinion, what why study myth? What does it bring to the life of uh, someone who uh, is, is just trying to figure out, you know, meaning in this world, um, say for the average person, why, why study myth? Well, one simple answer is that uh, myth is the repository of everything that is important about human civilization. Uh, and and all, all of the arts and the cultural arrangements and the music and the philosophy and the literature uh, the poetry, the dance, uh, these are things that um, I value most highly in, in my life. And they're essential to the structure of the mythology program at Pacifica as a, as a genuinely uh, interdisciplinary um, endeavor that really provides people who come to the, the curriculum with a, an education that in many cases they never got. Um, you know, reading the literature and being exposed to the arts and so forth. Uh, so that's a hugely important part of it, the, uh, the importance of the humanities and our, our uh, human cultural expressions over the long, long journey of the evolution of our species uh, is really what it's all about for me. But it, it, logically, when you start to read deeply or engage in these uh, artifacts that have mythological uh, resonance, it, it does in the most mysterious of ways activate the own, your own internal dynamic uh, imagery in, in whatever field of creative expression that you uh, pursue. Um, so it has an immediate impact on a personal level uh, of, of the development of one's engagement, with the, the most important energies that come through uh, the various expressions of myth uh, 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 globally, really. And then right alongside that multidisciplinary uh, celebration of the humanities uh, is the multicultural diversity of the subject. And Campbell is way ahead of the game on all this with a wide range of diverse cultures, people of all colors and ethnicities and national backgrounds uh, we're all welcome in his pages, and he devoted respectful, profound, uh, intelligent conversation about mythologies from parts of the world and cultures that we would know, you know, nothing about. And uh, he seemed to have an intuitive understanding of what the energy of those cultures. So when he started talking about the African Bushman trance, for example, or the rock art in South Africa, or going down into the caves of Lascaux. It wasn't really just communicating information, which is enormously important, in my opinion, when it comes to the humanities, but it was also providing a direct, intuitive, powerful experience of the importance of those mythological images coming out of a wide range of cultures to, you know, growing up in suburban middle America after World War II, you know, you have a certain sense of entitlement. Um, and uh, sort of a, a sense of, I have to say, of a superiority of your own culture. And then uh, you get exposed to these absolutely marvelous cultural documents um, from uh, all of the different um, uh, 
countries of the world. And it just makes one more profoundly connected in a human way to the planet as a whole. And hopefully uh, that engagement uh, and celebration of our similarities and differences, you know, will will have some important impact on the very turbulent times that we're in now with all of these stupid divisions and entitlements and supremacy movements and all that stuff. Um, it should counteract, I, I, I hope, the kind of blind, uh, myopic uh, narcissism that um, is a part of our psyche, naturally, you know, but myth can help uh, crack open that shell and, and really connect us to each other globally uh, and to the natural world, um, which is another passion that Campbell had coming out of his love for Robinson Jeffers uh, poetry. Lance, thank you for those wise words. Let, let's dig deeper into uh, the flight of the wild gander. What was your experience in, um, in, in tackling this material and trying to uh, suss out you know, what, uh, what, what Campbell was getting at and then present that to uh, the rest of us in a way that we can digest? Well, it's a very serendipitous kind of thing that's characterized my relationship with Campbell all the way through from the beginning um, to the end, really. Um, but I was um, uh, reinstating uh, a class on Joseph Campbell's work at Pacifica and preparing um, pre preparing the class. And, you know, it's, it's a hugely complicated problem. What book do you teach? You know, how are you going to do this with all this incredible material? And uh, I felt at the time when I was preparing this class that the flight of the wild gander presented you with so many facets of Campbell's work, the diversity of his interest that all intersected with my own uh, interest as well. The grail romances, the folk tales. Um, but then in addition to that, those incredible chapters on the emergence of the high civilizations of the Middle East and the relationship to the cultural symbolism of the mandala and so forth. So I, I, I was already working on that, um, that PowerPoint. I had a lot of it in place so that when we went to that meeting down at uh, LAX with, uh, with Bob proposing this uh, plan for the study guides, and asking who'd like to do which one and the other. Uh, I had already had the PowerPoint. Um, so I had something to work with. And I just then had to translate the PowerPoint into a Word document and, and a text and then add things that are a part of the study guide. Um, uh, but this particular text for me is uh, one that uh, really is, serves as a fine introduction to the many aspects of Campbell's uh, academic scholarship uh, and, and work. Um, so that's really how the, the, my connection to the study guides uh, began um, oh. serendipitously. That, that, that is an interesting serendipity that, uh, that, that uh, occurred. Um, you know, with, with the, the, the flight of the wild gander, a lot of people, you know, see the name of that book and um, th they have no understanding of, of what the book would be. They say, is this a, a book about uh, birds and mythology? Is this a book about, um, yeah. uh, you know, what, what is this about? Um, can you connect that title to, uh, to, to the, the material for us? Yeah, I, one of the first um, talks that I went to when I moved out to California and went to graduate school in Claremont and drove up to Montecito to hear Joseph Campbell speak uh, at the Casa Maria and the, when the Human Relations Institute was the, laying the foundations for what would come become Pacifica. He did this wonderful meditation based on the breath and the repetition of the mantra Hansa and the way that that mantra works. With, Hansa, uh, it refers to the wild gander, which is essentially an image coming out of Hinduism related to uh, Brahma. Uh, Brahma is that wild gander who incorporates the elements, fire, air, earth, and water, 
and flies uh, like the soul in a migratory pattern uh, over the Himalayas. So it represents the kind of internal experience of, of the transcendence of the soul uh, represented by the flight of, um, of Brahma uh, uh, or on the wild gander, the, the, the wild goose. So the meditation that he did was when you breathe in and out, ah, sa hum, hansa, sa hum. If you reverse hansa and you say sa hum, it means I am. So the meditation is with every breath, uh, I am that wild gander, uh, that immortal principle of the soul represented by Atman the internal uh, reflection of Brahma. So it's that immediate uh, connection through uh, meditation when you're guided by a master like Campbell, where it's just not a matter of um, an intellectual experience of the meditation. Uh, all of a sudden, here we all are, kids, lying around in cyberspace on the back of the wild gander um, in one of the Buddhist heavens, let's say whichever one Campbell might be in. Uh, so that uh, that meditation uh, with the bird and the symbolism of the gander related to uh, Brahma and the incarnation is is um, is my sense of the, of the importance of the title. Mm. Thank you for that. That's, uh, uh, I, I think, very revelatory for many who don't uh, ha have a sense of um, what um what campbell was talking about with that flight of yeah. the wild gander um in speaking of that is there a, a favorite quote or a favorite passage that uh stuck out to you as you were going through the book and preparing the study guide uh you know it's one of those books that is just so full of things it's impossible really to to uh to isolate ones that you've done so beautifully in your presentations those great quotations that gets to the heart of the matter. But I do have my PowerPoint on the screen from um, my screen uh, from working uh, on on the uh, text of the study guide. And I'm just going to pick a section. It's called the biological function of myth uh, in the section called bios and ethos. And, uh, and the quotation is that uh, uh, is the biological function of myth to create a second womb, a system of symbolic potentialities, symbolic potentialities that function as a protection uh, of, of the psyche. And uh, this sense of the protection of the psyche, of course, is, is also critically important. So myth provides a place where things can gestate where things can be conceived uh, and then can grow uh, the symbolic potentialities within all of us. And it's the growth of those symbolic images that function as a protection of the psyche. Now, you know, Campbell's lifetime was the existentialist period of Sartre and Camus and uh, the existential movement and the uh, Nietzschean experience of annihilation and nothingness. And there are moments, of course, in all of our lives when we suddenly are awakened to the, our complete insignificance in the face of the eternal oblivion of the cosmos, of time and space. And that uh, my mysterium tremendum, that terrifying experience of the numinous and the opening of consciousness beyond our capacity to hold it. Um, so myth also has that protective function of the womb. It gives us a protected space, a habitable space, you know, in the context of, of the uh, history of the cosmos, really. Mm. Um, so that's a, just one short sentence from that quite fascinating section, I think, in the Wild Gander. Mm. What a rich idea. Lance, um, how could we best use this book? What, what uh, you know, your perspective as a mythologist and is um, a, a, a teacher, how, how can we best use this book? What, what is this book going to help us, uh, us do? Well, you know, in a way, that's for everybody to find out for themselves. 
you know, Campbell wasn't one of telling you what life meant or what direction you should take, but he was one who did offer the opportunity of finding out for yourself what it's all about and making contact with these energies through the exposure to the wide range of mythologies that he's got in the wild gander uh, will inevitably trigger uh, some connection, uh, a deeper connection to the work on a personal level um, for uh, one's own growth and development and uh, understanding of where we are. But, you know, I am a teacher. I have a vocation. I'm committed to it. And uh, I uh, have com uh, the sense that this, uh, if one is a teacher and there is the opportunity to teach interdisciplinary subjects like mythology in the high school or a com um, community college or university, that uh, this is a very useful uh, pedagogical text. Let's put it that way. And after all, I am a professor. And I do think about pedagogy and teaching. And uh, my favorite quote really is from Chaucer uh, about the clerk of Oxford. And uh, Chaucer's quote is, a gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Hmm. And the two things are so central to, to my life that uh, it, it's, there's, a, there's no boundary between the personal engagement and the professional pedagogical uh, aspects of my work. Hmm. Well, as someone who has personally benefited from your work and your teaching, I'm I'm forever grateful that uh, that you've engaged in in work like this. It's been instrumental in my own journey and uh, in um, my work as a mythologist. So I'm I'm so grateful. Thank you, John. Well, I'm lucky one to have you as a student, and now wonderful role. You're kind. Taking on taking on this incredibly important work. Mm. and moving it forward thank keeping you. the spark alive thank you lance i wonder if we could ask uh, you to regale us with any stories of your travels with joseph campbell um any anything that you'd uh, be open to sharing with us well i'm thinking uh sort of combining the different moments and during the trip uh to france and the the underlying theme of the memories I want briefly to share is uh, this almost like an Irish second sight that Campbell had in terms of being in a place with his imaginative eye and heart open to its history and its mythologies. So uh, during that trip, he would spontaneously see things that I couldn't see or uh, the other people in the group. And so one occasion we were on the coast of Brittany and I went out and ran into Joseph Campbell and we took a little walk on the stone pavement overlooking um, the bay, moving out into the ocean. And he turned to me uh, and said, look, there go the Phoenicians. And, you know, this was important to the Grail romances because the Phoenicians came up through the Straits of Gibraltar, uh, stopping along the coast in Brittany and Cornwall, which is a tin uh, tin uh, market, tin and copper make bronze. So it was a very important location for the Grail stories that involved that contact with the Middle East through the Phoenicians. And uh, after that experience, we got on the bus and we drove to the Loire Valley. And um, I'm sitting, I sat with him on the bus on that occasion. And he's pointing out all these chateaux in the, on the horizon in a little copse of wood in the distance. He's seeing a chateau and I cannot see it. So he put, there, there's another one. There's another. There's chateau all over the place here. <laughs> and I couldn't see a single one of them. But uh, he knew he knew where to look and he knew how to communicate the invisible energies, you know, of the historical roots that, that surrounded him. And uh, the end of that day, uh, well, we, we stopped and he told the wonderful story of, of Merlin and, and Vivian. Um, uh, in the woods of Brocelion, and then we came into Chart at the end of the day. He, he, I was still sitting with him on the bus, and he said, "I'm, I feel very chez moi, BC, because I feel very at home here because that's when he was 26 years old. He spent hours and days at Chart, looking at all the stained glass and 
and the sculpture and so forth. Um, but actually my fondest memory, a couple of them were from the trip to Egypt. And one was when we went down into one of the tombs and uh, when we came back up out of the tombs, we were greeted by a, a, a whole gaggle of kids on a field trip from the Cairo, the local high school. And when Campbell came up out of the, out of the tomb, uh, they all burst into turbulent applause. And <laughs> the, the smile on his face, I don't think I'll ever forget. It's just a spontaneous connection to the moment uh, uh, there uh, in Egypt. Um, indicating his beautiful, spontaneous personality. Uh, but then the, probably the best memory was going in to have a picnic lunch uh, in Kenya beside one of the rivers and sitting down to the table with these box lunches that included bananas, uh, surrounded by these capuchin monkeys that were just waiting to get out our boxes. And I put my box down and I opened it up and one of those little capuchin comes over and he starts to reach into the box and I start to try to prevent him. And the, the monkey looks up at me with that toothy smile, <laughs> our terrifying teeth, this little tiny creature with the result that I went back like this. The monkey grabbed the banana and scampered off into the tree. And by some good fortune, I caught a beautiful picture of Joseph Campbell laughing uh, when, when, when he saw that happen. He just you know, burst out laughing when he saw this capuchin monkey pulling a trick on a stupid little kid from Baltimore who was in the, you know, the, the wrong place at the right time for that particular little critter. Um, so all kinds of stuff happened, you know, along the, along the way with those trips. And um, uh, it'd be nice to have more time, uh, yeah. but I'll leave it at, I'll leave it at those few, a uh, few images. Oh, that's a gift to us, Lance. Thank you. And as Lance and I uh, prepare to start wrapping up our conversation, we will be moving to your questions here in just a few moments. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask Lance, um, please go ahead and, and put those in uh, the, the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, we're, we're happy to uh, get to as many questions uh, as we can today. And Lance, as people are, are getting the, uh, the questions ready in the Q&A, um, I, I wonder if you have any final thoughts or, or wishes for readers of The Flight of the Wild Gander that you'd like to leave us with. Well, I, I think just that you read it and, um, you know, take advantage of the incredible education that it offers. And uh, primarily, uh, but along with that, there's the hope that well, maybe there's an aspect of one of the fairy tales that Campbell mentions, or maybe there's a piece of the chapter on the grail romances uh, that, that uh, Campbell mentions, or that particularly engage you. Uh, and, and then uh, finally, uh, as you know, uh, Campbell never uh, was able to finish his book on the way of the celestial lights uh, in the series of the historical Atlas of World Mythology. But you can really see the whole basic idea behind that in the chapter devoted to the civilizations of the Middle East and the various stages of their development with the ceramics and the, the temple sites and the cities and so forth. Uh, and then how that intersects with the whole quite daring conversation about the symbolism of the mandala that uh, Joe uh, Lobel addressed so beautifully in his podcast and raising the question in a Jungian environment uh, in Ascona uh, of whether in fact the mandala was universal and still uh, an applicable symbol for us psychologically, uh, spiritually and culturally. You know, uh, that was a bold uh, question for him to ask in a world surrounded by, um, uh, by Jungians who uh, have this fundamental faith in the symbolism of the mandala as being the most appropriate expression of the wholeness of the psyche. Um, so it's, the, it's it, you can see the celestial lights, you know, coming. You never got to it completely. I don't know what's going to happen with the material, uh, but it's great, great material. Um, 
and it, it lends itself then directly to deeper psychological and spiritual questions regarding what what is the you know this the the mythic image for our our particular era yeah. and uh, it's all in the context i initial chapters about uh, science and physics and the great expansion of our understanding of the breadth of the cosmos and what kind of images can we will emerge spontaneously collectively that reflect those uh, new directions that the human psyche is taking well lance i i so appreciate uh, you you taking time to be with us today and um to have Thank this you, conversation and uh, Stephen, I, I, I would love to know what's going on in the Q&A. Uh, bring, bring us some, some questions that are coming up. We have a few good questions. I started off writing the questions down and deleting them. Uh, I also have a question uh, for you, John. A little later on, we'll get to it. I don't want to distract from uh, Lance's wisdom here. Uh, one question, which was interesting, um, either in Gander or in Campbell's work in general, are there areas where you find Campbell's scholarship falls short? And that's for Lance. Well, I mean, there's no lack of uh, critical attacks on Campbell, you know, from various... Um, the tensions that we're all experiencing uh, now uh, for confronting gender issues and diversity issues and representations of minority populations. So I, I naturally I, I'm aware of these and have heard the criticisms about Campbell's uh, sexism, for example, with respect to the heroine's journey. Um, perhaps uh, didn't talk as much about the female experience of the journey uh, as he might have uh, as, a, as a legitimate uh, question or criticism in his work. And then uh, fairly recently, a, a rather savage and reductive attack on the hero with a thousand faces uh, because of an absolutely dreadful sentence that I, I wish he'd never written uh, on, on the first page where he talks about the mumbo jumbo of some obscure witch doctor in the jungles of Africa. And boy, that's not good language. And it's a, it reflects a profound cultural inbred innate, I dare say, racism. Um, so uh, the upshot of that conversation was that, you know, Campbell didn't sufficiently address uh, the African-American uh, uh, experience. Uh, but there again, that's very problematic criticism because there's so much on Africa in the historical atlas of world mythology. Um, and uh, it's just really a matter of uh, a creative response to his work. And if there are areas in which the scholarship is, uh, you know, spotty, well, that's when the next generation, you know, kicks in and picks up the work from there. So you start with the criticism and some perceived inadequacy. And then you start to fill in the blanks um, using the contribution that he made uh, as the foundation uh, for new directions, really. Good answer. And my understanding from what I've read of Campbell is that he never expected his work to be taken as the final term, you know, thus saith Campbell, and that ends mm -hmm. everything. Here's another yes. question. They're beginning to flow in really well now. Uh, from someone named Anonymous. This individual always asks questions. <laughs> uh, Joseph Campbell often spoke about overlapping themes in mythology from disparate cultures and civilizations. Where's the best place to go through all of his scholarship to find these? That might almost be too much to cover. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I have a simple answer, and it's read the historical atlas, all, all four volumes of it. And then you, you see the incredible range of the cultures and the scholarship. And, you know, the challenge is the historical atlas, of course, is out of print. But there are many places you can go to find paperback copies. Uh, 
and I actually obsessively tried to replicate the historical atlas in my PowerPoints, this crazy endeavor, you know, scanning the images and recording the stories and, and all of the things I did for the flight of the wild gander. Um, but I would, I would turn to the historical atlas of world mythology and uh, don't neglect the footnotes. Uh, the, the scholarship is uh, staggering and the languages, the French, German, Greek, Latin, Sanskrit. This man was a scholar and there's nothing wrong with being a scholar or an intellectual. There's, it has its own creative energy. And I think the historical atlas is definitely the, the magnum opus um, with regard to his scholarship. Yeah, some years ago, uh, Bob Walter and David Cudler were looking at, you know, reprinting that. But a lot of the permissions for pictures had expired. And the expense, right. I think, was going to be larger to secure Staggering. those permissions than the budget of the foundation. Staggering. But it's a yeah. wonderful find. Here's one yeah. from Kimberly. Uh, did Campbell give any indication of what he thought the third world myth might be? And she provides examples, of, you know, the first, I eat you, you eat me. The second being accepting, negating, transforming. Um... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, he did, of course, uh, suggest, I think this is very much a part of the power of myth and the visuals that start the series, that the mythic image for our day that say replaces the Virgin Mary or the Buddha um, uh, is essentially the picture of the earth taken from space and the point of view of the consciousness of that wonderful astronaut Rusty Schweikert who talked about the music of the spheres uh, looking back at the earth and that that brief moment of hope that we all had about a global kind of you know Aquarian age, 60s revolution finally happens and we're all part of the world and uh, loving uh, uh, the collective uh, experience of humanity on this little tiny speck in the middle of the eternal cosmos, you know, just opening the consciousness. So that, I think, was his proposition for a mythic image for our time essentially related to the image of the earth from space um, and how that might change our consciousness um, I guess we need to do more than just think about the image because obviously the world is being torn apart by all of the there's no recognition of a shared humanity um, it's very sad to live to be my age at this time and see what's happening to our nation and to the world, it makes me depressed. <laughs> the old men are inclined to depression, so we have a right to be anyway. But that's a little glimmer of hope, really, that sense of a global awakening of consciousness. I'm with you right there, Lance, especially on older men, sometimes a little bit despairing. Uh, here's... <laughs> Here's a question that is interesting. It's a little bit more practical. Uh, this is from Alan, who asks, I wonder what the hardest part of making a study guide for a compilation of essays is. One would assume that it's easier to make such a study guide for a book since its content is unified and mm -hmm. consequently its purpose. So I guess yeah. he's looking at the difference between, you know, would this have been easier if you were doing it, you know, a book around a single theme? Well, you still face the same problem. Uh, how do you condense an extraordinarily complicated text to a couple of PowerPoint slides? And how do you extract the, the essential information, you know, w w without um, neglecting any, any, anything important in the text? So it really is a kind of matter of uh, distillation and focus on the individual chapters, you know, just to get uh, uh, an introduction to the content so that the book doesn't seem so totally overwhelming, uh, which it can, I think, um, uh, to some people. 
So it's the, really the condensation of the essence of the ideas in the form of the images and the quotations that you pick. Um, and that's was a big part of my job. That brings up a corollary question, which is really for John. Uh, a couple of questions have come in on this. One, do we plan further webinars like this? And someone asked about a webinar study session, but related specifically in my mind to the question that Lance just answered about study guides in general, is there a study guide planned for a hero with a thousand faces? Well, we, we are looking uh, very closely at that. We recognize the deep desire for that. Um, we, we have determined if we uh, go down that path, that there would not be just a single study guide for the hero with a thousand faces, but multiple study guides, depending on what lens someone wanted to approach that text with. So the ideas we're playing with are, uh, would there be a uh, study guide for uh, the hero with a thousand faces for writers, filmmakers, screenwriters, storytellers? Would there be a uh, study guide for psychologists? Would there be a study guide for business leaders? Um, there, there are so many different lenses that you could bring to that text. And so uh, we, what we're investigating is what would be the best approach um, that would be helpful to the most people. Uh, to answer the, the other question that you mentioned, we are indeed planning for more webinars. We have a lot of ideas of ways to uh, keep bringing Joseph Campbell's ideas um, through this video format and through these conversations. And we've got a number of different ideas about webinars that we're really excited to be announcing soon. So we have a number of big announcements coming this fall that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll tease you with right now. Uh, but yes, we definitely are considering, uh, not even considering, we will be having more webinars and uh, we're excited to share what those will be themed around and some of the guests that we'll have uh, coming in for those webinars. So thanks for that question. Okay, and by the way, I apologize if it looks like I'm distracted and not paying attention to the answers. I'm trying to follow through the questions here. One, I think we can take care of without a, you know, there's a question asking for a link to the historical atlas of world mythology. We don't have one. It's, you know, you could look it up at all the usual online suspects, but most likely, you know, if say you go to Amazon, for example, you're going to find it through used or, you know, third party booksellers. Occasionally it shows up on places like I want to say Etsy. That's not right, probably. But, you know, things of that sort. eBay, it I think you're thinking of. There mm -hmm. you go. There. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That that shows my knowledge of the Internet. And now mm -hmm. this is a, an intriguing question. I've heard it many times before. I will toss it over to Lance. Uh, and we expect, expect a comprehensive list, Lance, in answer to this. <laughs> Who are the comparable Joseph Campbells in our modern times? So I, I had to teach a class called Approaches to Mythology, um, which I ended up teaching a very broad thing, theoretical approaches to myths, starting with Plato and Aristotle and Empedocles, coming up to the postmodern world and so forth, going through the romantics that were so important for Campbell, the German romantic movement that generated uh, you know, Freud and Jung and Campbell. Uh, but among those people, you know, I thought, well, why don't I just do it my way and have fun and uh, teach Mircea Eliade's books, uh, a good friend of Campbell and a, and a, and a fine uh, advocate of his work, uh, to teach uh, Heinrich Zimmer's work, uh, largely edited by Campbell uh, posthumously. And then in, a in addition to that, to make a sort of uh, Jungian quaternity, you know, with Campbell and Eliade and uh, Heinrich Zimmer, uh, I would love to include Henri Corbin's work on Islamic mysticism and to give us, you know, four kind of uh, manageable uh, uh, 
assignments that are can be read with enormous interest and pleasure because these were all great writers and that 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 would be my um, four horsemen of the apocalypse when it comes to uh theoretical approaches and conversations about myth but you can see it how dated i am because i'm not talking about derrida and lacan and foucault and the, the wonderful ideas that the post-structuralists had or i'm not talking about levi strauss um either so there are going to be some some omissions in that and levi strauss of course would have to be included in anybody's list of influential mythologist for our our time and, and there are some good short selections from levi strauss that you could include in this hypothetical uh, grouping and then you could add in K. kumara swami's books you know on on the hindu world that campbell is also very friendly and uh, collaborator kumara swami um so it would be fun to do do a um, a class like that with those particular writers as the mythologists of his generation um, that he shared a lot of uh, energy with. Oh, I had to get over to my unmute button. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, also, I would be willing to posit that we have the next generation popping up out of Pacifica, among other places, too. Some amazing people, you know, John, I'm looking at you, uh, you know, uh, people who are carrying it forward. And in mm -hmm. many ways, I think everybody who's here, you know, in mm -hmm. the audience, not just the panelists and so on, are continuing Joe's work. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Cora. Uh, how did people learn about Joseph Campbell's ideas and concepts on myth? over the past years and where is such a demand on efforts making studying guides um so we'll toss that to lance and john you might want to weigh in too yeah uh john might be better capable of answering this because there's sorts of questions that he's got to think about you too every day you know <laughs> what do we what, what do we do with the work and how do people get introduced to it and how do we yeah. take it forward in terms of the past, um, you know, obviously the Bill Moyer series and what was it, 86, 87, uh, The Power of Myth. So many people got interested in myth at that time through through uh, television. And of course, it, the foundation for that were all of the lecture tours that he did as a retirement job, basically, was to, was to go to Egypt or Africa or Mesoamerica and do you know, a, big, a lot of uh, lectures came through that way. Um, how it moves forward, of course, is is a challenge uh, for all of us um, with Campbell's work. Yes, I, I think there's um, there's almost a magical energy that seems to carry Campbell's work into the world. I, you know, this last year watched um, the the behind the scenes of the television show The Mandalorian, where uh, John Favreau and Dave Filoni were talking about how um, Joseph Campbell's work had influenced them so deeply in the uh, uh, the the creation of this new Star Wars television show. Um, I, I know in the the most recent Barbie film that the creator of that film had the star read one of Joseph Campbell's books before then. So. We are looking mm -hmm. at different ways as the foundation to um, come alongside of that and, and um, you know, br bring his work in it to as many uh, corners of the culture as possible. Got a lot of exciting plans we'll be announcing in the, the coming mm -hmm. months, but we're almost out of time. So I want to uh, thank Lance so much. Let's hear it in the chat for uh, Lance and this amazing presentation that he was able to bring to us today. Thank you so much, Lance. And as You're promised, uh, we, we promised you a, um, a, a promo code and uh, this is that promo code. This code is only good on the JCF uh, uh, shop if you go to our website. For the next two weeks, when you purchase the e-bundle, just enter Ganderwild 
in the checkout and you'll get both ebooks for $9.99. Now that is a bargain uh, to get both the Flight of the Wild Gander ebook as well as the study guide ebook on our website using the promo code um, Gander Wild. You can get them both. So that will save you some money. Uh, remember, JCF purchases are, are, are gifts to us. They're tax deductible. And we really do appreciate you supporting the work of the Joseph Campbell Foundation. It allows us to continue to um, bring material like we're bringing through these webinars. And speaking of webinars, I also want to let you know that we have one more study guide webinar coming up. We invite you to join us on October 28th for the Thou Art That webinar with Andy Gervich. And uh, Andy is going to uh, be talking about the, the work that he did on the, the Thou Art That study guide. We would love to have you with us for that. So please join us on uh, October the 28th. We're going to um, conclude uh, things to honor your time on this Saturday. We thank you so, so much for joining us and hope that you will come back on October 28th for our next webinar. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend, everyone. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.